Since the dawn of man, humans have explored their curiosity and exercised their creativity to develop everything from the ancient stone tools of our ancestors to breathtaking revolutions in the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases. But what happens when we allow our curiosity to straddle, or in some cases breach entirely, the lines of ethics and morality? I am Night Terror. And today, I invite you to join me as we investigate the shocking facts behind five horrifying human experiments. Number 1. Landis's Study of Emotional Reactions in 1924, Dr. Carney Landis, a psychology graduate at the University of Minnesota, devised an experiment to determine whether different emotional stimuli produce the same physiological responses within humans. Specifically, his study focused on how our facial expressions change in response to the various emotions we feel. Dr. Landis began the experiment by painting lines onto each of the participants' faces where the facial muscles were. This gave him a reference for how each individual muscle group within the face was moving, and thus would form the basis for determining if these mechanical responses were indeed the same or similar between individuals. During the experiment, Dr. Landis subjected his patients to various stimuli while simultaneously taking pictures to record their reactions. The experiment began relatively mundanely, asking participants to listen to jazz music, read passages from the Bible, or smell ammonia. However, the experiment rapidly escalated when he began to show the participants pornographic images, medical photos of people suffering terrible skin conditions, and even fired a gun to capture their moment of fright. He then had participants fishing their hand into a bucket without looking, and asked them to search around the bottom. The bucket itself was full of live frogs. However, hiding at the bottom of the bucket were a series of live electrical wires that gave the participants an actual electrical shock. This, however, was not the worst thing Dr. Landis subjected his participants to. During the last stage of his study, each participant was given a live mouse to hold in their left hand, whilst he handed them a knife in their right. The participant was then asked, very plainly and without emotion, to decapitate the mouse. While some participants thought he was joking at first, unfortunately for them, he was not. For those who refused to kill the animal, Dr. Landis intervened, and did it himself in order to record their reaction. As you can imagine, the reactions to this particular demand were wildly different and complex in nature. Some participants cried hysterically, others burst into laughter, while others still simply froze. Whilst all of the above may seem bad enough, there are two shocking facts of this experiment which are rarely touched upon. The first, being that one of the participants chosen by Dr. Landis was a 13-year-old boy who was at the department as a patient suffering from multiple psychological issues and high blood pressure. Secondly, during the decapitation phase of this study, two-thirds of the participants actually complied with Dr. Landis's order to execute the live mouse, a fact that may well have formed the basis of the famously shocking Milgram experiment, which in 1963 saw psychologist Stanley Milgram conduct a study into obedience of authority figures. Number 2. The Tuskegee Syphilis Study The Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, to give this next experiment its full title, was an extremely unethical study conducted between 1932 and 1972 by the US Public Health Service. To begin, 600 participants, all of which were impoverished African American men, many of whom had never visited a doctor before, 
were told that they would be receiving free health care from the United States government to treat bad blood, a term used in the area to refer to a variety of health issues. However, not only were none of the participants informed of their actual diagnosis, none gave any sort of informed consent that indicated they agreed to taking part in a clinical study of this nature. Of the 600 unknowing participants, 399 had already contracted syphilis prior to the study, and 201 formed the control group of participants who did not have the disease. During the study, the men were given no effective care or treatment for syphilis, and instead were given things such as aspirin and mineral supplements, things which the researchers knew were ineffective against the disease. Treatment, however, was not the purpose of this particular study, and as the name suggests, the real research being conducted during this 40-year experiment was on the natural history of untreated syphilis and its devastating effects on the human body. Some 15 years after the study began, penicillin had became the recognised standard treatment for syphilis. However, researchers continued to leave the participants without effective treatment, and withheld penicillin and information about it from participants, even going so far as to deny them access to treatment programmes that were being offered to other local residents. One particularly shocking aspect of this whole event was that it was revealed that in 1996, a full six years prior to the termination of the study, Peter Buxton, a venereal disease investigator from San Francisco, sent a letter to the National Director of the Division of Venereal Diseases, expressing his concerns about the ethics of this particular study. The Center for Disease Control, or CDC for short, which controlled the study by that time, had stated that the study would continue until all subjects had died. The study, however, only concluded when a leak was finally made to the press in 1972, which led to the termination of the experiment on the 16th of November that same year. Tragically, by the end of the study, of the 399 men who originally had previously contracted the disease, only 74 of them were still alive. 28 of them had died from the disease itself, another 100 died from related complications. 40 of their wives had been infected with the disease, and 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. If any good came out of this experiment, it's that in 1974, Congress passed the National Research Act, and also created a commission, the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, whose purpose is to study and write regulations governing studies involving human participants the result of which now requires that participants must give informed consent, must be informed of a diagnosis, and the studies themselves must provide an accurate report of the results. Number 3. The Monster Study In 1939, an experiment was conducted by Mary Tudor, supervised by Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa. The purpose of the experiment was to see whether or not Mary could induce stuttering amongst children who had no previous indication of speech problems, whilst also attempting to prove that telling an individual who suffered from stuttering that their speech was fine would have a noticeable impact on their speech. 22 subjects were chosen from a veteran's orphanage in Iowa. None of the participants were informed of Mary's intent, and they believed that they were all to receive speech therapy. The children involved in the study ranged in age from as young as 5 up to the age of 15. Ten of those selected had been marked by the teachers and matrons as having speech difficulties. The remaining 12, however, were normally fluent in their speech and showed no signs of stuttering at all. On Mary's first visit, she tested each of the children's IQ and also identified whether or not they were right or left-handed. One theory at the time of the study indicated that there may be some correlation between stuttering and cerebral imbalance. For example, a left-handed child who used their right hand to perform tasks. It was believed that this may cause nerve impulses to misfire, thus affecting the individual's speech. Wendell Johnson, Mary's supervisor, 
was not a proponent of this particular theory. However, she wanted Mary to test the children regardless. During each of Mary's visits, she spoke to each child for around 45 minutes, following a specific script. When interacting with children who suffered from stuttering, Mary would give them positive reassurances that their speech problems were simply a phase that they would grow out of, and to pay no attention to what others said about their stuttering. However, to the children who did not suffer from stuttering, she would inform them that the staff at the orphanage had indicated they had troubles with their speech, that they were displaying symptoms of a child who's beginning to stutter, that they shouldn't ever speak if they cannot do it right, and other such negative affirmations that their speech was beginning to deteriorate. The impacts of Mary's conversations with the children became apparent as quickly as the second session, when five-year-old Norma Jean Pugh, who had spoken normally and freely the month prior, was now showing reluctance to speak. Another child, nine-year-old Betty Romp, refused to talk and frequently held her hand or arm over her eyes. The oldest child in the group, Hazel Potter, had become much more self-conscious and talked less than she previously had. Hazel also began to snap her fingers in frustration frequently. When asked why she was doing that, she stated, because I'm afraid I can't say the next word. The results of Mary's interactions with the children had a severe impact on their school performance. The children with no previous speech issues were now finding it difficult to recite in class or simply refused to do so. One child became withdrawn and disobedient and eventually ran away from the orphanage two years later. Shockingly, Mary Tudor visited the orphanage three times after the study concluded in an attempt to provide follow-up care to the children involved. She informed the children that in reality they had no speech issues at all. However, on the 17th of August 2007, six of the children involved in the study were awarded a total of $925,000 by the state of Iowa for suffering lifelong psychological and emotional scars caused by their six months of torment during the experiment. While none of the children did indeed become stutterers, they did become increasingly self-conscious and reluctant to communicate. This infamous study was dubbed the Monster Study by Johnson's peers, who expressed their horror that he would use orphaned children to test and confirm a hypothesis. Number 4. The Aversion Project During a period of institutionalized racial segregation in South Africa, between 1948 and the early 1990s, known as the Apartheid Era, Dr. Aubrey Levin, a South African-born Canadian psychiatrist, conducted a medical torture program known as the Aversion Project. The purpose of this program was to attempt to cure homosexuality amongst gay conscripts in the South African Defence Forces. The program forced the identified individuals to submit to torture methods such as chemical castration and electroconvulsive aversion therapy that was meant to reorientate their sexuality. As part of the therapy, the men were made to view pictures of naked males and encouraged to fantasize about them before being subjected to agonizing electrical shocks if they showed any sign of sexual response. The voltages were increased if the individual continued to display signs of sexual response to the images. They were then shown color images of women in an attempt to stimulate arousal. This was, however, more often than not unsuccessful. Shockingly, when it was deemed that conversion therapy was failing, staff put patients through a sex change operation. This not only included the patient being put through extremely invasive surgery against their will, but also giving them a new identity. The patients would then be discharged from the military and advised to cut all ties with their family and friends. It's said that as many as 900 men between the age of 16 to 24 years of age who had been drafted into the SADF were forced to undergo surgery to change them into women and given new birth certificates. Unfortunately, a large number of these individuals did not survive the surgery itself, and those that did were often left with incomplete sexual reassignments and received no follow-up treatment or checkups to establish their physical or mental well-being. Additionally, 
No help was given towards the cost of the expensive hormone drugs the patients now needed following their reassignment surgeries. In 1995, amidst allegations of being an abuser of human rights, Dr. Aubrey Levin fled South Africa and moved to Canada where he became a teacher at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan. However, in 2010, the college suspended Levin's license after he was accused of making sexual advances towards a male patient. After four years of being on trial for the alleged assault of 30 men during counseling sessions, Dr. Aubrey Levin was eventually sentenced to five years in prison on the 23rd of April, 2014, and he currently remains there awaiting his release. Before we get to the last experiment in this list, I wanted to say a huge thank you for watching, and I hope that you'll stick around for future content on the channel. With that being said, if you do enjoy this sort of content, please do me a huge favour and click that subscribe button and notification bell to be notified when I release new videos. Number 5. Unit 731 While the other experiments we've discussed in this video have been unethical and horrifying, the infamous case of Unit 731, the Japanese Covert Biological and Chemical Warfare Research and Development Unit, is perhaps the most disturbing of them all. Unit 731 was officially known as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army. The facility began development in 1934 and finished being built in 1939 at the beginning of World War II, and in 1941 it officially adopted the name Unit 731. Within the confines of its walls, researchers conducted gruesome human experiments under the project codenamed Maruta. Some 3,000 men, women and children were taken as prisoners and forced to take part in these horrific experiments. Scientists within the facility called these prisoners logs and would refer to them as such when asking about test results, such as, how many logs fell? This sick joke stuck amongst the staff of Unit 731, as the cover story given to local authorities was that it was simply a lumber mill. The activities that took place within Unit 731 included vivisection, the removal of organs and limbs often without anaesthesia, frostbite testing, forced pregnancy amongst the female prisoners, and weapon testing, the latter of which saw staff use humans become test subjects for various grenades, flamethrowers, germ-releasing bombs, chemical weapons, and explosive bombs. However, this was not all. Many, many more experiments took place within Unit 731, including food and water deprivation, prisoners being placed into high-pressure chambers to observe how much pressure the human body can take before the victim was killed. Prisoners were also subject to things such as severe burns, injected with animal blood and seawater, being spun to death in a centrifuge, receiving lethal doses of x-rays, and even being buried alive. Staff at Unit 731 were also responsible for the research, development and experimental deployment of bio-warfare weapons, including bombs filled with infected fleas, clothing and supplies. An estimated 400,000 Chinese civilians are thought to have died as a result of cholera, anthrax and the plague as a result of these weapons. Further to the shocking facts of this hellish facility presented here, it is said that before Japan's surrender, the facility was destroyed. In order to ensure no evidence was left behind, the remaining 400 prisoners were shot dead and staff sworn to secrecy. Not only this, but mice infected with the bubonic plague were simply released into the wild. This is thought to have caused the death of approximately 30,000 civilians as the mice spread the disease. Perhaps the most shocking fact of all of this is that in 1946, US General Douglas MacArthur granted every single one of the Japanese scientists involved in Unit 731 full immunity from the war crimes they had committed in exchange for germ warfare data gathered from the experiments. Unit 731 then 
was a truly depraved, gruesome, wholly unethical and disgusting series of human experiments that lasted for roughly five years. Let that sink in for a moment. Prisoners within Unit 731 were subjected to these heinous acts of torture, 24 hours a day, for approximately 1,825 days. 43,800 hours of never-ending torture, excruciating pain, and death. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening. Leave a comment below and let me know which one of these you found most horrifying and disturbing. Also, I'm curious to know what you'd like me to cover next, so let me know what you'd like to see in the comments. Until next time, take care.